me. So uh, Giuseppe and I actually present two uh, sides of the same chapter, and so this is a slide that obviously you saw at his presentation uh, as well. Just to make clear, three components of ICP. There's the arterial component, uh, which has uh, heart rate and cardiac output related changes that you can see in the curve, but also uh, changes related to the vasogenic tone. There's the CSF component, where the Monroe Kelly uh, uh, doctrine actually didn't talk about in the book. So the original Monroe Kelly was only about the vascular uh, uh, compartment. And there's the venous outflow uh, component. This uh, is also something you saw. This is a graph from a, a review, uh, a review pa paper by Steiner that is also in the uh, Dropbox that you will get, which also shows an additional component which I will uh, uh, show to you later in the presentation. That is the relationship between the amplitude and the absolute uh, value of the ICP. But we will come back to this graph uh, later. And so any well PV relationship uh, is, is what, what we call compliance and the compliance of the whole uh, um, uh, contents of the skull is, is, is uh, obviously the sum of the arterial, the CSF, and the venous uh, compliance. Where the arterial compliance actually is the lowest of the three. So you, you will only see the effects in that compartment when the others are uh, more or less exhausted. The first description of ICP measurements dates from uh, 1951, a paper by uh, Guillaume and Jani but actually it's uh, uh, Nils Lundberg who is generally considered to be the father of ICP measurement. And this is a fantastic graph actually. It reads from, uh, from uh, um, right to left. So this is where the situation starts. They have a patient after severe TBI who uh, certainly goes unconscious and develops a very high uh, ICP value where they use urea, which was the osmotic therapy at that time, so not mannitol or not hypertonic saline, but urea goes down a bit, but goes up again. They start cooling the patient, they get to control the ICP, and of the four patients they described, they actually had two patients with good outcome, which is certainly not bad in the 60s. So how do we monitor ICP? Basically, there's, like, there's three techniques uh, currently available. So you have the intraventricular catheter, which is still the gold standard, which has the advantage that you can zero it. So there's a less problem with drift. You zero it at the foramen of Monroe, and we consider the external uh, uh, meatus acousticus as the uh, foramen of Monroe, but there's the risk of infection. Then there's the other uh, two uh, since which, which we call parenchymal uh, catheters. There's actually two ways of measuring this. There's a strain gauge, which means that as the pressure increases on the catheter, the electrical resistance will change, which will result in another uh, value. Uh, you don't have to uh, zero them once they're inserted. The drift is small, but it is there, and the longer you monitor, the, the, longer your, the more your drift uh, will be. The infection risk is very low. You should uh, take into account, however, that these parenchymal catheters, they measure a local pressure. So this means there might be a left-right difference, there might be a supra and infratentorial uh, difference uh, within the skull uh, as well. And then the optical, so the fiber optic method, the neurovent, uh, actually the same uh, advantages and disadvantages as the, as the other intraparenchymal uh, measurement. And I think Giuseppe already convinced you that ICP uh, is important. So we come to the threshold of ICP. And it's actually, you can split it up in two ways, and maybe the debate has been confusing. So there's actually the threshold where ICP is associated with worse outcome, and there's a threshold where we start aggressive treatment. And that's probably uh, something uh, different. But the guidelines, the recommendations are there, so we should uh, treat uh, or, or think about treating above 20 millimeters of mercury, but at the same time look at other parameters that can help us in the decision. And why this 20 millimeters of mercury threshold? Because in all uh, observational studies, there's a correlation between ICP and worse outcome somewhere between 15 and 25. Uh, so this, these studies have been going on since the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, and uh, Giuseppe also cited this paper by Tony Marmaru, Beyond Age, Admission Motor Score and Pupils, which are still the components of the impact and the uh, crash models, 
the proportion of ICP measurements greater than 20 millimeters of mercury is most indicative of outcome. So above 20 is definitely bad. Of course, just being above a certain value is not enough, so it's also the dose of intracranial hypertension and how can you calculate the dose? For instance, you can calculate the area under the curve of all measurements above 20 millimeters of mercury and you can clearly see that the higher the dose is, the higher the probability or the, the proportion of patients with a poor outcome. Now, all these papers have been based on manual recordings. If you do computer recordings, and there's a couple of papers looking at it, when you store data minute by minute, you see that manual recordings actually underestimate the number uh, of episodes. And if you do an AOC or an, uh, of ICP and CPP of continuous recordings, it's even more predictive than based on manual recordings. And this is some research that we did, that we presented as an abstract uh, uh, at the Brussels conference this year, and we have a pediatric paper at this conference now, where we actually, um, it's, it's, it has more than, it, it has multiple dimensions, this graph. So we associated the number of episodes of a certain duration with outcome, where we said blue is good outcome. So an episode of that duration, of that intensity, when it's blue, it has good outcome, and the redder it is, the worse the outcome. And what we came up with was this exponential graph, where you can actually see that almost all episodes of above 20 millimeters of mercury are associated with worse outcome, except when they're very brief. Um, and you can also see that even lower thresholds, uh, when, they, uh, when the duration is long enough, are associated with uh, bad outcomes. So below 20 is not necessarily safe. Now, I was telling you there's two sides of this debate. So there's what is associated with bad outcome, 20, 25 millimeters of mercury, definitely associated with bad outcome. But what the aggressiveness of the management can also harm the patient. So if you manage your ICP very aggressively, if you give more sedative, more barbiturates, more vasopressors, more fluids, this is not good. So this is not what you want to do. You only do this when you have a very good reason to do this. And actually, this retrospective paper by Kramer was one of the first to say, yeah, maybe being too aggressive can also be bad without leading to a, to a better outcome. The DECRA trial, early decompressive craniectomy. So even very brief episodes of elevated ICP definitely resulted in worse outcomes than when you didn't do that. Okay? So this is one more um, illustration of the fact that if you're too aggressive at 20 millimeters of mercury, you might might make things worse than make things uh, better. And then this trial, focus of debate of the last uh, uh, two years. So um, the conclusion, this is literally the conclusion of the paper um, that when adding uh, intracranial pressure monitoring to a setting where they weren't used to working with it, that, it, that they weren't able to improve outcome in, in that setting. But the ICP-based management was more efficient. So it allowed you to uh, apply less aggressive therapies of which we know and of which we fear that might be uh, detrimental. It allowed you to, do, to be less aggressive, actually. There are several weaknesses about this trial. So the setting, uh, the setting is in, 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 in South America. It's not the Western setting that we're used to, pre-hospital. Uh, only 45% of the patient came by ambulance, which at least in our country is definitely different. We don't know anything about post-ICU care because there, were, there was a small difference in mortality after two weeks that disappeared. So what happened afterwards? How was the revalidation of these patients? There's concerns about statistical power because they powered on the number of monitored patients. But as Giuseppe already said, putting in a monitor will never improve outcomes. So is the management based on the monitor? So maybe they should have powered on the number of patients with uh, need for treatment. There was concerns about uh, cerebral perfusion pressure management. Uh, you can argue that a VED might allow you to do therapy as well. And definitely the therapy in the control arm was more aggressive with longer duration, with uh, more hypertonic saline, more uh, hyperventilation. Uh, so they actually treated them uh, more uh, aggressively. So ICP, ICP threshold, well, if it were that simple, eh? if we could summarize the whole complexity of it, this should be bigger than, of course, not smaller than. 
but if you could summarize the whole complexity of a brain with one number and that's the only thing you would have to look at, it would be very simple. That's not the case. So you have to f collect the best information on supply and demand and the best information is ICP amongst other things, amongst imaging techniques, amongst your clinical examination and maybe other uh, additional monitoring techniques that my uh, colleagues will talk about uh, later to best, well, create the best atmosphere for the injured brain to, to recover. Now let's talk about ICP curve interpretation and, and uh, Giuseppe already touched this uh, briefly. Uh, I still have uh, nine minutes of time. So the ICP uh, waveform has different components which you can uh, uh, split up due to uh, by, by frequency domain analysis. So there's the heart rate waves, there's the respiratory waves, and that slow wave formerly known as the Lundberg B waves. Uh, you will see that when they get bigger, you, become, you, you go into a pathological situation. And you've seen this graph by Giuseppe. So you have three components. So the first peak is a systole of blood pressure signal, whereas the other two refer to the transmission of the arterial blood uh, volume in the, in the brain. And indeed, when this peak becomes higher, it's a sign of a pathological uh, situation. Now, what you usually will observe, that is that when the ICP is low, the pulse amplitude is also low, whereas as the ICP uh, goes up, these B waves become more uh, pro prominent. And this actually indicates a reduced compliance. This indicates that the arterial com component of the signal is becoming more important relatively to the rest because the other mechanisms are exhausted. And you can actually express this mathematically because there is a correlation between the amplitude and the uh, value of ICP up to a certain point, and this is a, where, where the decompensation starts, where you, you, where you get a negative uh, association when well, all, all uh, comp compensatory mechanisms are lost. And this index, I've, I've promised you I would show this graph again. This index is between minus one and plus one, and in normal circumstances should be zero, but in, in the steep part of the curve, you can see that the index will go up. And calculating this moving correlation index can give you an, an indication of where uh, on this curve your patient is positioned. And if you see that this RAP index rises to plus one, you know you're very close to decompensation, okay, where it will become negative, and at that point you're, uh, you're probably uh, too late to do anything. Now let's talk about plateau waves, uh, also known as the Lundberg A wave. So there are these high... Uh, uh, amplitude episodes of above 40 millimeters of mercury are usually self-limiting or you can stop them by hyperventilating the patient and they last between 5 and 20 minutes and actually are not associated with bad outcome. Or why are they probably not associated with bad outcome? Because they occur when autoregulation is intact. Because it's actually uh, a vicious circle that, uh, that, that happens. So there's a drop in blood pressure. So what will your blood uh, vessels do when autoregulation is intact? They will vasodilate which will cause a rise in cerebral blood volume, a rise in ICP, which will cause a further decrease in CPP, further vasodilation, up to a plateau here, where you're at maximum vasodilation. And then what then occurs is either a Cushing reflex causing a rise in blood pressure, vasoconstriction, and a drop in ICP, or something we do, like giving mannitol, like hyperventilating the patient and reversing uh, this cascade. And so now we've come to the point of autoregulation. And when it comes to ICP curve interpretation, this has been an insight of the past decade. Autoregulation, you probably all know, the capacity to keep your cerebral blood flow constant within certain uh, regions of uh, blood pressure. Um, and how does this work? Because your vessels constrict until they decompensate and where you get pa uh, passive vasodilation or when uh, blood flow is too uh, low, you get hypo uh, perfusion occurs within 15, uh, 5 to 15 seconds and has been demonstrated to fail in several situations of brain injury, traumatic brain injury, ischemic brain injury, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so outside the zones of, hyper, of autoregulation, you can have hypoperfusion, you can have hyperperfusion, and both are detrimental. So you don't want that. How can you assess that? Well, you can do imaging. You can take your patient to the scan, but it's pretty uh, cumbersome. And as you know, that it might change within a patient in time, you won't drive uh, your patient to a perfusion <laughs> CT uh, every day or several times a day. So you would like something to 
to uh, monitor it continuously. And so there are indexes, they all end with an X, where there's a surrogate marker of CBF um, and its response to uh, spontaneous fluctuations in, in uh, blood pressure. And so if you see, if they vary to, together, the patient is pressure passive and is not autoregulating, whereas if they vary inversely with each other, you can consider the patient to be pressure active and uh, autoregulating. And what are these natural va variations? I've already told you. You have the slow wave. You also have respiratory wave. Um, and some indexes work with high resolution data. Some work with average data. Some work with minute by uh, minute uh, data. Now the challenges are that this is a signal where, with a very low signal to noise ratio. So there's, the magnitude of these fluctuations is small and there's a lot of confounders there. But by continuously measuring uh, over time and average, averaging uh, the values, you, there's still an index that at least has an association with outcome. And so how can you calculate it? You either can calculate the phase shift. So if a phase shift of 180 degree, you, get, you have autoregulation, whereas here, this is a passive uh, uh, patient. But this depends on the stability of the frequency of these slower waves. Whereas time-based method, you calculate the correlation between the marker of cerebral blood flow and the blood pressure, and when it's a positive correlation, patient is pressure uh, uh, passive and not autoregulation, whereas when this relation is constant or slightly negative, the patient is actively uh, autoregulating. And probably the most well-known and most used of these indexes, because there's a lot, and I'm not going to discuss all of them, I must confess that we contributed to this uh, amount of literature by publishing another index based on minute by minute data, but this index based on high frequency data, the PRX, uh, that you can buy as a software ICM Plus uh, that you can, that's available from Cambridge, is actually something that can be used to assess at the bedside the autoregulatory function. And what it is, it, as it, does it do? It looks at the uh, um, Pearson's correlation coefficient between average six seconds blood pressure and ICP value, and it looks four minutes bad. And so pressure passive means ICP varies together with the map, pressure active means it varies inversely with the map. And can you use this clinically? Well, in an ideal situation, we could use it to determine the optimal cerebral perfusion pressure. Because if you would plot this index, this PRX, which is here bad, because it's very positive, these are very good zones, and here it becomes bad again. In about 60% of the patient, you get this U-shaped curve where you could argue that maybe in this zone, autoregulation is most active. So in this is the zone of blood pressure or cerebral perfusion pressure, we should keep the patient in. Now, this has all been done in retrospective studies and is associated with better outcomes at six months, but, and there's a, a large but here, this can only be calculated in 60% in of the time and there's no prospective testing of this strategy. So this is a theory, this is a hypothesis. This may, we may choose this strategy over an empiric fixed CPP strategy, but we actually do not know whether it's better and whether it's even feasible to precisely steer cerebral uh, perfusion pressure uh, to, to that uh, range. So in summary, ICP is an important signal. I think nobody argues about that. And high values are associated with worse outcome. The big question is, or the debate is, which is the threshold to initiate aggressive second tier therapy of which we know that it might damage the patient if applied to the wrong uh, patients. There's more information in the ICP signal. There's the autoregulation information. There's the information about the amplitude. And the autoregulation-based CPP management for the moment is an interesting hypothesis for the future, certainly not an established thing uh, we should do. But what we should realize is that ICP monitoring is part of what we've been doing in the past decade and that the outcome after uh, traumatic brain injury in the past decades has, uh, has improved and even uh, at a 9% per decade rate. And CTs, ICPs, aggressive treatment protocols are all part of that. So it's going to be very difficult to highlight or take out the things that are not good and detrimental and keep out uh, the, the good parts. And this is a final remark by Randy Chestnut, the first author of the best trip trial. He still says that the use of an index is still preferable to uh, treating empirically 
that the ARCP-based management was more efficient, so they didn't have to use all these aggressive therapies in all patients, and the interpretation of the ICP treatment threshold should be based on more data, so we, uh, on, on, on imaging and on multimodality monitoring, which is, I think, the introduction to the next uh, speakers. Thank you.